Yo, yo, yo. What's good, everybody? It's your boy, JTL. Opposite from the norm. Before I get started, make sure you like, share, comment, and subscribe. All right. So, uh, I be seeing a lot of conservatives <laughs> uh, who, who like Tommy so well. So, uh, I've gotten into back and forth with people on YouTube. I can't help it. That's what I do. Um, but they kept bringing his name up. So I'm like, let me do a reaction video for him because I want to see what all the hoopla is about for white people to be telling me I should listen to him. Black people listen to Tommy so well, we'll be better off. So let's see what he's telling y'all white people and, and white conservatives. Which brings us to something that you refer to in a number of columns as the retrogression, the experience of African Americans in this country. Mm. Economic progress, I'm quoting you. Despite the grand myth that black economic progress began or accelerated with the passage of the civil rights laws and the war on poverty programs of the 1960s, the fact is that the poverty rate among blacks fell from 87% in 1940 to 47% in 1960. But over the next 20 years, the poverty rate among blacks fell another 18 percentage points. This was just the continuation of, pre of a previous economic trend, but at a slower rate of progress. It was not some grand deliverance. Close quote. Now, I will say something on that. Malcolm X always spoke on that. And this is uh, right before 68. You know, Malcolm was assassinated in 65. God rest his soul. And he was saying, we believe in something that's not going to come true with liberals and their ideals. So, Malcolm already seen that coming. That is so counter to what we are taught in school, what appears on the... Real quick, even though uh, a lot of white people like was disgusted with Malcolm, especially Republicans, which I don't get because he was always saying don't trust the white devil period <laughs> but he was saying a lot of the same things conservatives were saying even though they detested him but i digress editorial pages of newspapers <laughs> I, have, I feel as though i want to ask you you really want to stick with that <laughs> that is well, I, I, I have more evidence than, than my most, most recent book uh, discrimination and disparities uh, i point out that this really is a pattern not for you to blacks or even to the united states that you can see the same thing in England, you can see it in any number of other countries, that the poor were, were, were much worse off economically, let's say in the first half of the 20th century. And yet, they, in terms of their own behavior, they were, they were, they had, they were far more decent uh, societies. Uh, and, and afterwards, after, after this welfare state that's supposed to make them better off and, and, and better human beings, that's when the crime rate skyrocketed on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, the British were, no, were famous for being perhaps the most polite, considerate society uh, in the world prior to that. Uh, after that, you get things like the 2011... Just in case anybody got lost, he's basically speaking how uh, socialism doesn't help, um, help like the economy. Riots over there, in London, Manchester, where they where they going through this. They 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 anticipated Ferguson uh, and uh, and uh, Baltimore by a few years. And the same thing is the, the, the burning down of, of buildings, the throwing of gasoline bombs, at police, the whole schmear. Uh, and none of those people were descendants of slaves. So so the. Poor people were doing, if the, the lesson of the 20th century is something like poor people, including in this country, African Americans, were improving their lot and leading fundamentally decent lives until the government decided to help them. Yeah, yes. That's a, that's a fair statement. Well, they, they, they're, they're better off uh, economically because of what's been given. Right. But of course, when you, when you have the crime rate... I mean, I, I, got, I got the first inkling of this some years back when I was uh, uh, at some school in Harlem doing some research. And I looked out the window and I missed... 
real quick before he moves on, I'm not going to do the whole video because it's like uh, almost 40 minutes left. I'm just going to go through it about 10, another 10, 15 minutes. All right, so they're saying that blacks was doing better before we allowed the, gov the government to step in with uh, socialism. But the problem I have with that, a lot of people, uh, especially people like him, he's an economist. Um, he does research, data, and stuff like that. But the problem is they, they always leave out certain numbers. And if they bring it in, they might misquote it. He doesn't talk about all the things that was going on with black people for his racism and systemic racism. Okay, He doesn't bring up um, a lot of places that end up having um, oppression-related rights. And I call it oppression-related rights because... You're oppressing the people. Sooner or later, we're going to fight back and revolt. So you don't bring up a lot of places that got burnt down. Like, it's a lot of... Me and my partner are going to do a show on that brief. Um, shortly, God willing, we're going to do a show on that. And we're going to bring up a lot of black towns that was getting burnt down since slavery. So, um, the ending of slavery. So, they don't... They never factor in the fact that it was a lot of regular just hatred of, of you know, racist whites. That was coming through and burning down towns. They don't never bring up the fact that a lot of these black towns, when they wanted ch to try to do certain things, they had to go through city officials. That's just like a lot of black towns that were trying to get railroads. They had to go through city officials to get certain things done. Now, you can blame it on de Democrats if you want to. I just blame it on racism all across the board because you can pull up stuff that shows even conservatives was committing racism on black people. You know what I mean? So... If you have black people that was trying to migrate to white places and conservative or not, they didn't want them there. But back to what I was saying with the railroads, you got a lot of towns that were trying to do that. I believe Tulsa, Oklahoma was one of them. They were trying to get railroads. They didn't get the OK. They didn't get the sanction. So that fell a lot of black communities when it came to the railroads and stuff of like that. So you have things of that nature and you have situations like um schools right so say education like schools that can't get the books and all that and they're relying on the government because it's a public school it don't matter if it's a black community if it's a public school and they can't get the right books that they need they can't get the right funding that they need and all of that so public schools still have to rely on the government now like they say if, if the community it has a like a lot of money flourishing through it that helps the school because of the taxes. So if you have blacks doing so well back then in these days, all the way up to, you know what I'm saying, let's say it's 1970, from, you know what I'm saying, out of slavery to all the way to 1970, if you mean to tell me we have public schools and blacks were doing good, but a lot of those schools still were shitty, it's because even though they was paying taxes and stuff, a lot of them, like them city officials and stuff, didn't give a damn to help black people. So they never bring up the systemic racism that was going on, you know what I'm saying, with the education system, them trying to bring up their economy within those black towns and, and not being able to be sanctioned to do certain things. And they don't bring up this great racism and hatred that those racist white devils was burning down black communities. So they leave a lot of that stuff out and that they just try to leave it to oh, black people just decided to go ahead and get handouts. No, black people is looking like, well, damn, I'm staying in my own community. I'm trying to, because they just making it about the handouts. But, like, they don't talk about black people, say, black people that try to migrate to better communities for their children to get better educations, which we see still today. I remember when I was younger, a lot of times, you know, I'm going to schools that's far away from me. You know what I'm saying? But it's because, so if these schools suck that's in my community, I'm trying to, my family trying to move to another community and y'all won't let me in. I mean, what, what you think? So desegregation was not just because black people wanted a fucking handout. It was also so they can send their kids to better schools. It was so people can get better jobs. You know what I'm saying? If you get, if you at Tulsa, Oklahoma, and they burn your shit down, and you try to move over to another black town, they burn that bitch down, or it's, it's you know what I'm saying, economically impoverished, you know what I'm saying? Because of systemic racism, you not going, you, if you, because they always say this, uh, real quick before I start a video back, they always say, well, if you're going through this in your community, just move. That's what a lot of white people, um, conservatives say, just move. But we talking about any time when you can just do that. That passing, that when I was a little kid, I used to walk my dog in that park, and looks of horror came over the students' faces. 
nobody in his right mind would have a child going to that park, walking a dog or not. The principal was warning these students not to cross this park, which is about a block and a half wide, uh, even in groups of six. Uh, when I, and, and when I told them about how in his hot summer nights I would sleep out on the fire escapes in Harlem, they looked at me like I was a man from Mars. People were doing that all over New York. They were doing it in Philadelphia, Washington, wherever I've known people. That was a common thing for poor people. We didn't have the money for air conditioning. Right. You slept out on, on the fire escape park where Walter grew up in a... In a Walter Williams. A, Walter Williams grew up in a, uh, a housing project in Philadelphia. He would say on the hot summer nights, the people would be in this project would have, have little balconies. They'd sleep out on the balconies. And the one on the first floor who didn't have balconies would sleep out in the yard. And that there were old men who would, you could see sit on a hot summer night sitting outdoors into the wee hours playing cards or, uh, or checkers or whatever. It was a different world. It was a safe tragic, world. And it was infinitely safer. Now, what about family structure, Tom? Again, I'm quoting you. Most black children were being raised in two-parent families in 1960. 30 years after the liberal welfare state, the great majority of black children were being raised by single parents. Yes. How, what, what, what's the... What, how does that... By the way, we should, we should note that Pat Moynihan, Patrick Moynihan publishes the Moynihan Report in 1965. Yes. And he's alarmed because the illegitimacy rate among black families is 25% then. Now, among whites, it's over a third. Yes. Hispanics, it's over half. And among African Americans, it's over 70%. What's going on there? Well, this again, this too, you find the same thing in Britain. You find it in uh, France and Norway. You find it in the Western world. Uh, in, in fact, uh, there the dissolution any, of the family structure. Oh yeah, there are any number of uh, Western nations where forty percent of the children are, uh, are raised with with only one parent. Right. Uh, at the extremes, uh, I, I, I compared to uh, Asian uh, countries. Uh, at the extremes, uh, Iceland, it's uh, two out of three uh, children born are raised in a single parent home. Uh, in South Korea, it's one out of sixty six. Wow. Wow. And so, that's the one. Now, um, he's talking about the devastation of black families and bringing up contrast to, um, I'm sorry, in relation to other countries, you know what I mean? Um, the, you know, all the numbers that went bad with two parent homes from whatever race to different countries besides the Western, you know what I'm saying, besides the United States. Oh, fair state? Well, yes, it is. Oh, you, you, you're paying, you, you, you're creating a situation where if the, if the uh, first of all, uh, you, well, you're, cre you're creating a situation where if the man stays there, the, the government will not give them, give the woman welfare. Uh, and if he leaves, he, he uh, they will. And so they're paying, they're paying, they're, when you pay people not to get married, more people don't get married. Right, right. Okay. So, so what would have happened? And he also basically saying that for the welfare of the state, not only hurt black people, it hurt other uh, races. You know what I'm saying? Other cultures by giving out welfare, saying that it, it, it promotes for you to be separated versus two parent homes standing together. And that's how the black community was messed up. But it also messed up other communities. And if Lyndon Johnson, instead of becoming a liberal, had remained a crusty, tough, skeptical <laughs> Texas Texas conservative, yes. which is certainly the way he started his career. If he, if Lyndon Johnson had embraced the constrained vision, instead of instituting the war on poverty and the Great Society and so forth, what would the country look like today? A lot better. You you would not have the same rates of crime and so on. Because you see, you can't have a welfare state in a democratic country unless you first have a welfare state vision. And when you buy all the assumptions of that vision, then you're buying a lot of trouble. One of the, one of the episodes I think epitomized, it was in France in this case, uh, that there were attacks, knife attacks by various people from North Africa against Chinese people in, uh, in some suburb of Paris. And one of the, the, the things that uh, the attackers said, you know, that uh, why, why are you attacking the Chinese? And it wasn't because of anything the Chinese had done to them. He said, they have nice clothes and big cars. That's not fair. I mean, that's, you know, egalitarianism as a philosophy is one thing. 
but the actual consequences of it uh, uh, mean things like uh, resenting other people's good fortune, right? All right, so... Okay, so right there he's saying because of welfare, giving it out, is making the countries worse, made black communities worse. The crime rate went up because people end up being jealous of people who have more than them because... You know, you get welfare, then it shuts down two-parent homes, which is true. You can see that by the numbers. Um, and it brings crime rate up. You know what I'm saying? Because the those families are doing worse. Like, a parent by itself is going to be hard of a struggle. And then, plus, from what I know, if you have a job, they raise the rent. So a lot of people ain't going to want to work. But this is the problem. What they saying for is what uh, socialism is and whatever. Like I said earlier just now, if you have situations where when people are trying and then you have all these situations coming at them, it's going to be hard for it to stay together. We got to realize what happened in this country. You can't, I'm not going to, let me, I'll get there in a second. But to make it just seem like somebody just jealous and nothing had to do with it is a lot. But let me get back to the video because he's going to say something else. I'm going to group in what I was going to say with that. One response to the gap. Again, I return to this gap between African Americans and other Americans. Affirmative action. Yes. Which brings us back to your alma mater, Harvard. According I to never, I'll never live it down. You'll never live it down. Yes. You once told me that the principal benefit of a Harvard degree was never again having to be impressed by anybody who had a Harvard degree. <laughs> Absolutely. So, these are figures that were published in the Harvard Crimson, the student newspaper. In the Harvard class of 2019, these are the kids who will be graduating next June, the average SAT score for black students was 2149. By the way, these are all good scores, but for black students, 2149, white students, 2218, Asian students, 2300. Well, now that must be reasonable because it's taking place at Harvard, the seat of reason. Well, uh, well that, that wasn't quite how I described it when I was there. <laughs> Affirmative action. Is that, is that we ought not to be doing this? You know, there, there are various uh, laws and policies that benefit one group at the expense of another. But I think affirmative action has the distinction of being one that harms everybody, though in different ways. And so you, 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 there, there, there's a lot of evidence that there are black kids who have all the qualifications to be successes in college, who nevertheless are failures because they are systematically mismatched with institutions whose standards they don't meet, even though they may meet the standards of 80 or 90 percent of the colleges in America. I remember I first aware of this when I was teaching at Cornell, and I found that half the black students at Cornell were on some kind of academic probation. And so I went over to the administration building and looked up the SATs of these students. The SAT student at Cornell at that time scored at the 75th percentile. Which is pretty darn good. Yes. And so that means that in, that in most colleges in this country, they would have no trouble, and many of them would be on the dean's list. But at Cornell, the average uh, liberal arts student at that time was in the 99th percentile. And, and when, you, when, you, when you're teaching the students, students like that, uh, you teach at a pace that most people of any race cannot keep up with. And I, I was, it was always complained that I was assigning all kinds of uh, reading. But heck, you know, I'm teaching kids who are in the top 1%. They can, they, they can keep up with, it, with the reading that I'm assigning. Uh, so Cornell was taking very talented black kids and spending four years teaching them to feel inadequate. Yes, and succeeding at that. Mm -hmm. um, a couple quotations. This is, these are both from the last affirmative action case. Real quick on that, what he said about the schools. The problem with that is a lot of schools and businesses that, that had to let in minorities is because a lot of these racist schools, like they saying black people, but this is what you got to realize. A lot of those schools was not admitting Chinese people either. If you notice, they never bring that up. They just make it seem like Chinese people work so hard and they just got there. No, affir affirmative action was off our backs, off black people backs. But it benefited women, especially white women, to get certain jobs they couldn't get. 
it benefited Asians as well, Mexicans and everybody. So every time they say Asians doing so great, affirmative action also helped them. Because a lot of these white schools was racist towards everybody. Not just blacks, but everybody. So when God bless us to get affirmative action, that helped Asian people get in there too. So don't so they tried to just skim it down to just black people and how it hurts black people, but it helped Asians as well. So if we didn't get affirmative actions, Asians wouldn't have been going doing as well for you to see that they was able to do so well if it wasn't for affirmative action. They don't talk about that. They just make it seem like, oh, it didn't help black people, it messed black people up. And then they'd be like, but if you just work hard, you'll be okay. Look, look at the Asians. Affirmative action helped that happen as well. To reach the Supreme Court, last big affirmative action case to reach the Supreme Court, 2003, uh, Grutter versus Bollinger. Here's the majority opinion, which was written by Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, quote, The court expects that 25 years from now, the use of racial preferences will no longer be necessary. This upholding the use of, in a decision, 5-4 decision, upholding the use of racial preferences. Now, that's quotation one. Here's quotation two, Justice Thomas, Justice Clarence Thomas, in a dissent, quote, I believe that blacks can achieve in every avenue of American life without the meddling of university administrators. The court holds that racial discrimination and admissions should be given another 25 years. While I agree that in 25 years these practices will be illegal, they are illegal now. <laughs> Close quote. So, here's, what do you do with the argument that Justice O'Connor, writing that majority opinion, there's something of the constrained vision there. Look, we have these all universities across the country are using these racial preferences to as the basis of admission. The best we can hope to do is... Real quick, I want to say this as well. If it wasn't for affirmative action, right? And this is this is what trips me out. Thomas Sowell, right, was in Harvard. He he got to go chance to go to Harvard, but he didn't say in what year. So most likely when he was able to go to Harvard, this is a probably most likely around affirmative action times. So you, because he had to graduate probably at least around the 70s. So you mean to tell me affirmative action hurt a lot of black people, but would it have you been there? Look at Ben Carson. Would Ben Carson been able to graduate and, and become a brain surgeon? I believe a neurologist, if I'm not mistaken, a surgeon. So, I mean, are you are you going to sit here and tell me that it really hurt us so bad when if, if racism was still going on and we would have stayed separated? Because me personally, I, of course, I feel that way. You know, we should have stayed segregated because for some reason, black people, that's the only way we work together is when we have to. You know what I'm saying? So I see why it hurt us. But I can't sit there and act like if it wasn't for segregation, I mean desegregation, we would have been able to make it to where we had a black president or Colin Powell or Condoleezza Rice or Thomas Sowell. Like these are the things that people don't realize. They're, I see everybody agreeing with him, but it's like, okay, if affirmative action was so bad, then how come a lot of things that you got privy to? It wasn't that bad for you. You saying it's bad for everybody else. They shouldn't try to uh, academically mix match people, but it helped a lot of black people, though, right? Tell them they ought not to be doing it. That they should be developing other standards and give them a give them a clock. Is that is, is that a reasonable thing to do? No, but it's a universal thing to do. Uh, I wrote a book about, about affirmative action because it was called Affirmative Action Around the World, and I made a couple of. Uh, International trips at the expense of the Hoover Institution uh, around the world to check on affirmative action. This is one of the one of the most common arguments, and it's absolutely fallacious time and time again. The argument that, that, like so much in the unconstrained vision, it assumes that we have a power that we do not have, cannot have, and never had to have had. Yeah, uh, in, in England there was a man named Scarman who was saying, "For now, we must do this in order to." Uh, and in many countries, these these programs are set up with an actual cutoff date. 
So it was set up with in, in Malaysia with a cutoff date, I think, of it's about it, it was set with 1990. And in Pakistan, I, it was like it was supposed to go for 10 years. None of those th the cutoff dates has meant a thing. These programs not only continue, they increase, they spread. So the idea that you can control for the future uh, because of these wonderful sounding words, I can't think of a country in the world the way, where, where that's ever happened. Uh, in the case of Pakistan, they did have an actual, actual cutoff date. Uh, and because of, uh, people in East Pakistan were, for whatever historical reason, way behind the people in West Pakistan. And so there's these preferences for East Pakistanis. Now, before time for this thing to expire, the East Pakistanis uh, seceded from Pakistan and formed a new nation of Bangladesh. Bangladesh right. And the preferences continued right on because there were other groups that had been added to it. And so like, once you get the constituency, you can't say no to them. But it, 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 is, it is an argument that, that, that has never worked out anywhere that I've been able to, to, to check. All right. So Tom Sowell says no to the welfare state, no to affirmative action. What is to be done? And now you were kind enough to share with me uh, uh, the galleys of your forthcoming edition of Discrimination and Disparities. Let me give you a few quotations from some of the new, the new chapter in yeah. that book. Quote, the poverty rate among black married couples has been less than 10% every year since 1994. As far back as 1969, young black males whose homes included newspapers, magazines, and library cards had similar incomes to those of their white counterparts. Academic outcomes show a pattern of disparities similar to the pattern of disparities in the amount of time devoted to schoolwork. Apparently, Lifestyle choices have consequences. Yes. Close. So now, gonna break it down to choices in in life and lifestyle. Okay. So uh, after this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end it, but I'm gonna go. I'm gonna give my my brief analysis on Thomas Sowell. Close quote. So this is the constrained vision once again. Welfare state that's government. We don't rely on that. Affirmative action government. We don't rely on that. We rely on hard work. We rely on the institution of marriage. Is, is, that's correct? Yes, in other words, these, these things, I don't think it's that the marriage as such or the library cards as such. It's that there are lifestyle choices that have been made. And, and the comparison I made was, was between, if you look at the poverty rate among blacks, uh, uh, it was a 22%. And among whites, it was 11%. But among black married couples, it was 7.5%. Right. So it's not so they not only do better than blacks as a whole, they do better than whites as a whole. And so it's 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 so so it's lifestyle choices. Similarly, with with the results and the some of these uh, more successful charter schools, that uh, you have these kids not only uh, meeting but exceeding the national standards in places like ha Harlem and Bedford Stuyvesant in the South Bronx. And these are not kids who are skimming the crown and cream. They're kids chosen by lottery. They don't even test them for ability. They don't even look at their academic record. They take them into the schools and they, and they, and they have hard work and they, they make it clear at the outset and they don't tolerate a lot of nonsensical behavior. Uh, and, and, and these kids are doing incredibly. So, Tom, here... Again, I think back to the Moynihan. Well, no, I think so. The Moynihan report in '65, and he was very alarmed by uh, the, the illegitimacy rate of 25 percent among African Americans. By the way, in fairness to the late Moynihan, we should point out one reason he was alarmed by this was his own his own father had walked out on the family That's when he right. was 10 years old. He experienced what it meant yes. to be to kids to have one parent. Okay, and now it's all gotten dramatically worse for whites and Hispanics and for everybody. Mm. And then I think back beyond that to your experience of Harlem. You drop out of high school and do what? Go on welfare? Start cashing? For no, you went to work. And you spent some of that money to buy... You went to work. Some inexpensive encyclopedias. Yeah. And the, the Harlem was... Sick. So... But I feel this uh, council, it's, it's almost a council of despair in that 
that world just seems so utterly vanished. No, or, no question. You, but do, so your argument is, if if we can stand up to the welfare state, we can somehow get back to that world. The family family structure will reassert itself. Oh, that, that's gonna that, that's gonna be reconquering the same ground, which is very tough to do. But it can it can be done. Uh, I was I was so lucky. I, I, at the time, I had no no clue about all this. I left home uh, at, at the, uh, in 1948. Uh, many decades later, I learned that the uh, uh, unemployment rate among black teenagers in 1948, 16, 17-year-olds, was uh, 9.4%. Among whites so the same age, it was 10.2%. So both blacks and white teenagers had only a fraction of the unemployment that they have today. Uh, you were expected to work. You were expected to be able to get a job. And more, more importantly, the jobs were there for you. Uh, and so, and what, what, this is because of a fluke, really. The, 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 the minimum wage law in the United States, the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938, uh, was passed with specified rates of pay that you're supposed to get. Uh, almost immediately, uh, inflation took off during the 1940s. So by 1948, those numbers that were in the law were meaningless. Oh, I see. In other, in other words, when I started out as a Western Union messenger, the minimum wage was 40 cents an hour. I started out at the bottom at 65 cents an hour. So it was the same as if there was no minimum wage. And this is what happened. You had this, and I was so lucky. I, knew, of course, had no clue about any of this. Now, now a, a black kid 20 years later comes in there. Uh, they've not, they, 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 people have become compassionate. They raise the minimum wage, so he can't get a job. Got it. And I don't think it does any, any community any good to have a whole lot of t teenage uh, males hanging around on the streets with no job and nothing to do. Right. Tom, so, by, by this, another thought here. You're describing a world, Harlem, the urban world, gone. Yeah. You, but you made visits when you were young. You knew the South as well, didn't you? Did you, 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 you okay, so I'm going to stop it right there before the end of something else. Um, see the name of the video if y'all want to watch it, whatever. Um, but let me speak on that when he said lifestyles and, and, and choices. He, he, he quit. He dropped out of school, but he went to work. This is the thing with lifestyles and choices. Like I said, the problem I have with the conservative thought process to me, it, it shows me implicit biasness. And to me, my assumption of it or my analyzing of it is like, okay, when, when, when I hear conservatives try to tell me by anecdotal, um, being anecdotal, it's like a lot of conservatives do the same thing. Like, all right, so say, and what, what numbers though? Because they'll throw their stuff in there and people they know, and they throw, they throw the numbers in there, like I said, with Asians, but Asians being able to benefit from affirmative action. So it's like, okay, then they, oh, I was able to do this, or you can point to this black person that did this, pull yourself up by the bootstrap. But the problem is when they say lifestyle, like I said, if you don't, you don't, if you don't break a, a black person's Willie Lynch chip, you're going to still have bad choices. And what I mean by that is, all right? They bring up Asians, they bring up Hispanics, they bring up all these other people, but you're not bringing up people that were descended of slaves. Then you brought up other people that the welfare state messed up other people. I'm throwing air quotes over here. Messed up other communities and it didn't help them and they wasn't descended of slaves. What you said right there separates it. Because if you bringing people up, you're doing them wrong, they're trying to do things on their own, and then your people is getting away of that. And then they're like, okay, we're going to hold you responsible. We hold the government responsible. The government did allow slavery to happen to us. But then you try to uh, relate us to people that don't have the same history. So how could you expect the outcome to be necessarily different if you have people that's trying to hold you down? And I'm going to say this too real quick. That's why I keep saying maybe we need to lead this country because if you mean to tell me every time we're trying to have something – this the systemic racism gets in the way. Maybe we need to go to another country like Asians did when they came here, or Hispanics did when they came here, or Africans did when they came here. Maybe we need to leave from here. And I ain't saying you got to go back to Africa. I'm just saying 
if it's like that here. But anyways, with lifestyle choices, the difference is this. If you're talking about, like, let's just say we're talking about Lil Bootsy, Benny the Butcher, peace and God bless to them. Rest in peace, King Von. Rest in peace, Mo3. You know what I'm saying? And it was a couple other young brothers that got killed recently. God rest their souls, too. I, f- I forget their names. Please excuse me. I, I never really heard of them before, so I apologize. But, all right, you got these young brothers I just named who were rich and famous. But they still were making bad decisions within their life choices and their lifestyle. They still want to be thugs. And look what the outcome was. But the difference in what I'm about to say is, okay, Lil Boosie, Benny the Bush and, and stuff that happened to them, which was unfortunate. Not saying it was necessarily they, they fought, but, you know, saying the type of people they around, the music they made, and the type of energy that gravitates towards them and, and they circle that they bring it, giving off that energy. If you're talking about somebody who has money and fame and still doing something stupid, that's different versus somebody who's black, growing up in a black community that's impoverished. To compare the two is, is totally different because those people were hard and got out of the hood, but they still had the same mentality. They brought the hood mentality with them. Like, Boosie, how do you become rich and famous and then end up about to be, you know what I'm saying, getting the, the needle? Thank God he, God bless him to get off. But you, you, God forbid you could have almost got the needle because of the person you, you, he was associated with because he's saying certain people's names in his music that was actually doing killings. And you associated yourself. That was a bad choice. And so I, I get that. But this is the thing you got to realize. Even with that being said, even with them having that fame and money, if you don't break a person's, if a person doesn't break their mindset, like they say you take the, the I don't want to say the N-word like that, but if you take a dude out the hood, you can't, but you can't take the hood out the dude, that's, that's the problem because the mindset wasn't necessarily broken. So look at the Willie Lynch. The Willie Lynch chip is to separate, divide, and conquer black people. So at that time, masters, slave masters, could get what they wanted, which was cooperation. You know what I'm saying? Which was, to, no, my bad, total submission to get work done that they wanted and make all their money off of our backs, our ancestors' backs. So even if you have black people who work hard and make money, but they still live making their wrong choices, it doesn't matter. So that means the mindset has to be broke first. He's talking about attacking affirmative action, attacking welfare and all of this, and, and the separation of families. The problem is not attacking the system to stop helping black people. It's attacking the mindset. The mindset has to be changed. That's what me and my partner is always talking about. That's why we do, uh, I do poly talk on Wednesdays. That's why HD does financial uh, Fridays is because we're trying to get some information on that, but that's why we also attack the mindset. Like when we said what I said about the rappers attacking that mindset, you gotta let the streets go. Also attacking the the the, the harm that's been done to us and trying to heal. That's why I say maybe right now we don't need to worry about relationships and trying to get married and all that, and worry more so about healing and learning how to love each other. And, you know what I'm saying, be around each other, appreciate each other, experience each other. Versus trying to tell me, oh, we can just be married, but you ain't ready for it. You're not mentally stable. Like, you know what I'm saying? And then also with the, the baby rate, it's not just um, people just want, black people just wanted to have sex because it's great. It's also the mindset of not having your parents or your father around maybe. Or your mother not being there like you need to as a young girl or a young boy. And you looking for affection. You see what psychiatrists talk about. A lot of young people look for affection in the wrong way. So that's why you have young brothers running to the streets. You have sisters, young sisters running to dudes looking for the wrong type of affection. So if you just talk about when we came out of slavery, we was hunky-dory, we was grinding and all of that. Yeah, because if you look at us coming out of slavery... And we still have an ancestral blood from from our, our homelands. Showed you that Africans that was brought over here to this country still had that hustle in them. Then plus you got to think slavery. They making them work. 
so these people basically knew how to do carpentry work and all that stuff. The building wants something for themselves, but it was modeled after their masters and stuff like that in this country. So you like, all right, well, I want that. So we're going to go over here and work hard and have that. But you act like coming out of slavery didn't, didn't still affect us. So you like to still come out of slavery and still have to deal with abolition, you know what I'm saying, of slavery, then having to deal with Jim Crow, then the great migration where black people, you know what I'm saying, by 31 years later after slavery would end it, well, supposedly end it, start trying to move to the north and move to the Midwest to try to get these jobs while industri industrialization was going on. You know what I'm saying? And trying to build and have something or build our own. You know what I'm saying? And then deindustrialization came not too many years after that. Then you still going through Jim Crow. You still going through segregation. You still going through racism. You still going through systemic racism. It's not like the breakdown of it was just because of the left. Like, that gets on my nerves when conservatives just try to break it down in that way. If we lead them to fend for themselves, they'll be fine. But the problem is, we can't just do whatever we want. You you see, black towns was getting burnt down. Even when we was to ourselves, fending for ourselves. It's like, well, damn, a black man can't have nothing. So that I believe, I believe in my heart that's where that phrase came from. A black man can't have nothing because of stuff like that. So you just try to say that it's because the government came in. The government had to. Look what they did to our people. But you have people, like when they was talking about the, the, the uh, constrained vision. You know, narrowing down to um, basically saying just because people think involvement of others trying to help people will innately, well, it's forcefully trying to get people to act like they would innately help people, but that's not, that's going against their nature. The problem I have with constrained vision is to me it's implicit biasness. You're just worried about what's yours it's my 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 push push shove 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 gimme gimme and you don't want to help nobody so the reason why you have a situation where you have people rise up and be like fuck it we're gonna come take it from you then since y'all don't want to give us what we're owed we're gonna come take it it's not just because you gave us some crumbs and you know what i'm saying you pushed the parents out the house and all that it's also the situation where the trickle down effect and I seen Ben Shapiro on another video try to say it's actually called, um, I forget what he said, um, something, side, something, I forget, I forget the name, y'all gotta excuse me, I, for, I forget what, what he, what he called it, but it's not called trickle down effect that conservatives say, he said that was made by the left, but that idea sounds like trickle down, um, hold on, I'm gonna see if, I, I'm gonna see if I got it on here real quick. Don't got it. But he, he tried to say, uh, actually, yeah, hold on. Um, let me see if I can find it. Nope, I don't see it. Nope. Well, but he, what he said sound like the same thing. If we give products, I mean, if we, if we do deregulation and, um, and, and make it to where people that are, product creators they'll be able to uh, flood the market you know what i'm saying that's what help with money and, and, and give jobs but the problem is it's bullshit because you got big companies like mcdonald's walmart these companies make billions of dollars a year and they do not they still don't pay employees so to actually sit there and act like we get a rate of affirmative action which would be stupid. Maybe we can regulate it better, but it'd be stupid because a lot of people don't wouldn't have what they have if it wasn't for that. But you mean to tell me if we around here having to pay our taxes, we still had to pay our taxes. So the government don't have to give us nothing. Black people wasn't even trying to get those type of tax breaks that white people was getting. So my problem with Thomas Sowell, and I'm not being disrespectful to an elder, you know what I'm saying? I'm not going to diss him like that. But the problem I have with his conservative view is that it to me it sounds and it seems that he is is really 
became uppity. He came from a a, a, a a modest place and then got your Harvard degree, got your Columbia degree. You became uppity. Now, he may have found things that bother him, but as he started growing and making money and you're around more conservative, you start being around more conservative people. Yeah, you're going to start looking at it like them. You kind of start to mirror them after so many years, after decades of being around them. But, you know what I'm saying? Now it becomes, to me, like when you try to use these numbers, you, like I said, you got to attack the mindset. That's the problem, the mindset. And to me, he start, people start saying an anecdotal because they, they go to a certain place. Well, they don't even, it's invis, their being anecdotal is invisible. Because they're hiding it by putting numbers in front of it. Really, you're going off your own experience. Because this is not people who are helping people that say that. That's trying to do their best. But it's attacking the mindset. You have to educate people. A lot of people, like what they say, one of the main things that separates poor people from rich people is information. I think also you got to say hustle. You know what I'm saying? You got to grind for it too. Even if you get in. Because I know a lot of people that are very, very intelligent. But they don't have the hustle. They don't. They don't grind to get what they want. So Thomas Sowell, I, I'm I'm being trying my best to be respectful. You know, so I ain't in the mode to just you know crap on. But I feel as though him and a lot of conservatives, whether they want to use numbers or not, you can go ahead and be implicitly biased to a situation that's going on to people and blame it on the left versus finding a better way to attack the situation. He does all the numbers and analyzing, but a lot of people don't worry they self that they trying to survive out here so i'm not saying give out a handout you know you can you can say opportunity is basically a handout because a person is not going to make it for themselves so opportunity still could be a handout i don't care how smart educated they are you giving them some versus them going to get their own could be considered a handout but i think the problem is like i said with conservatives is they always try to use excuses of why people should not be helped and I don't think that's the way to do it. It's attacking the mindset. Actually be out there with the people and help them. If you're going to sit there and talk about people, like, you seen he said the blacks. He didn't say us. He said the blacks. And I have a problem with the way he did that. But try helping people and educating them face-to-face and doing things that really help them. Like, if you feel affirmative action is bullshit, then why don't you go out there and try to help push for black people to stay going to HBCUs? And try to get those to learn, to figure out how they can fix it the way they stay with each other. If you're saying black people need to start, stop running to white people, then why are you always doing shows talking to white people about black people? Huh. Anyways, I'm going to go ahead and probably do another show. This took a little minute. Uh, hopefully y'all enjoy it. Leave your comments, like, share. If this is your first time checking out Opposite from the Norm, make sure you definitely subscribe. So, back at y'all.